Thank you. All right, Commissioner okay. Khan, we can start. Uh, first off, I'd like to, before we start the meeting, I just wanted to thank uh, Liz for all of her efforts of putting this together, and hopefully it will work. <laughs> thank you, uh, Commissioner. <laughs> now I'm going to call the roll call, I'm gonna call, the roll call and um, I'm just going to call people. Um, uh, Peter, you're on the line. Darshan is on the line. Yes. And George uh, Yamasaki is on the line. Yeah, I'm here. I don't know whether Reverend McRae is on the line. Reverend McRae, are you on the line? James McRae is here. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to ask for a motion on the adoption of our agenda. George Yamasaki, so moved. You didn't call my name. Uh, Scott, you didn't call my name. I'm, I'd like to be recognized as being yeah. here. Okay, yes. I'm sorry if I missed you. Yeah. I, the fact that I knew you were on the line and we had talked earlier, I guess I just jumped to it. But thank you, Rita. Um, so we have a, a, a motion for the adoption of the February 12th special minutes that we received. Yamasaki, move. I second. Dar Singh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Uh, now we're moving into our executive director's report. Uh, Trent? Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, Scott, just give me a yes if I am audible. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Okay, I'm going to move right into this. Um, uh, I'm going to do pretty much the standard report, federal, state, local, talk a little bit about the COVID response locally, um, and of course, the, we have our budget presentation today. But let me start sort of big picture level, um, and these are items that are sort of, you know, we haven't met since um, February, so. Um, kind of picking and choosing the highlights over the last number of months or, or lowlights, if you will. But let's start with some highlights. Um, uh, at, the, at the sort of federal relief level, um, a couple of things going on. One is the uh, unemployment, um, the, the added amount that the feds are providing for individuals who are unemployment in California. So Congress in March added an extra $600 to the weekly unemployment benefits for any person who qualifies to receive state unemployment benefits. And that includes furloughed workers. They automatically get the 600 added to their week, uh, added to their check uh, each week. This, uh, however, is set to expire at the end of July. Uh, and the reason I'm raising this is because, of course, as this expires, we will likely see an increase um, of applicants to our public assistance benefit programs, as you know. Um, so far, there's no talk necessarily about extending that past July, but, but you know, a lot of things are up in the air at the federal level, of course. Um, and the other piece that I want to just bring your attention to is the HEROES Act, which is the House relief package, it includes a trillion dollars to state and local governments and uh, to, to backfill our losses of revenue due to uh, the COVID pandemic and billions, billions of dollars nationwide for support through SNAP, which is, of course is CalFresh locally, housing supports and health. Um, it is paused in the Senate for now, um, uh, you know, sort of typical, I think, Senate uh, uh, Republican um, opposition to House-moved bills, um, and nothing has moved yet on that in the Senate, but we're, we're certainly tracking that and have put in our uh, uh, support to our lobbyists on this uh, piece of, of legislation. Um, it directly really ties into the state budget and the proposals that are coming out of the legislature as well as what came out of the governor's office in, in the May revise. So let me touch on that a little bit for now. Um, of course, a lot of, of course, what happens through the state budget um, but ultimately gets approved has a tremendous impact on how our local budget looks, both citywide, but, but HSA in particular. So basically the legislature has completed its budget process um, uh, and 
and it's now back to the governor and the negotiation right now between the Democratic leadership and the legislature and the, and the governor is going on now. But let me just tell you that, that the agreement from the legislature, I'm not going to talk about the May revise because it's really the legislature's, um, the, the budget that passed the legislature is the one that's, that's being negotiated. So the, the proposal closes a $54 billion budget gap. Um, really the same framework that the governor set forth, which is a mix of spending cuts, temporary new revenues, borrowing transfers, um, drawing off the reserves, um, and then looking at federal funds to support. And then a lot of what they call trigger solutions, which um, are either cuts that will likely have to happen if we don't get federal support um, and, and assumptions around federal revenue. Um, the legislature's version of the budget anticipates $14 billion of federal um, support. Um, and sort of their, their sort of assumption around federal revenue um, is different in the governor's in sort of a, in a big way. And, um, the governor's budget proposal in May proposes $14 billion in budget cuts that would immediately take effect. But then if the federal funds came forward, those cuts would be would would um, be restored. Now the legislature actually flipped that and said, we're going to assume federal money, and should the federal money not come in by October, then a, uh, a whole series of trigger cuts um, would would um, be moved forward. Um, it's good for us because it restores a lot of the cuts that the governor had proposed that, that hit us largely in Medi-Cal benefits, um, but other, other areas as well, child care being one, uh, and supportive services being another one. But basically under the legislator's, legislature's version of the budget, the most draconian cuts to our world, health and human services and the schools were taken off the table and actually replaced with other solutions that would be triggered should the federal government not um, uh, provide relief to states and counties. Um, sort of what, what the, um, just broadly, what the, what the budget is proposing, the legislative budget is proposing is, is um, really recognizing the increased um, support that people are going to have to rely on from county human services agencies in terms of CalWORKs, in terms of CalFresh, Medi-Cal, that are basically our benefit entitlement programs. And so um, as is what they typically do when they pro, pro, um, project caseload increases in these programs, a, uh, a corresponding increase to our administrative allocations, whether it's CalFresh, Medi-Cal, CalWorks, that's exactly what has been proposed. And so we are looking at potentially increased state revenue to support the increased caseloads in these areas. Now, um, it's not necessarily free money uh, because uh, obviously the load associated with these programs increases. Uh, and I'm going to talk more later in my report about what we've seen so far in terms of increased applications to our benefit programs. Um, uh, the biggest uh, winner uh, in terms of the legislature, in terms of programs, is CalWORKs, where the legislature is proposing additional money for employment services. Um, and supportive services for our families. Um, it returns the CalWORKs time clock to the 60-month time period rather than the 48, um, and uh, would would maintain the subsidized employment program that the governor had proposed to cut. So really a very large amount of investments in CalWORKs, recognizing that families with children uh, are disproportionately impacted by COVID, especially if they're low-wage working families. The government or the legislative budget also restores realignment money, and this is uh, uh, money that's used, state tax revenue that's used to support uh, our, some of our benefit programs as well as child welfare and adult protective services. Um, and so they provide uh, a billion dollars fill from revenue through 1991 realignment and specifically call out child welfare as being a, a uh, disproportionate recipient of these dollars. So um, that's high level, and I'm not going to go in program by program because it's a little too fluid right now. Um, but we will see a budget out of the governor, a budget agreement from the governor legislature, certainly by the end of the week. 
Um, they need to have something in place by June 15th, and there's nothing really to suggest that it won't be. Um, the timing, of course, for our local budget, because of the, the shift in the timeframes due to COVID, um, unlike any other year, we're going to know what's in the state budget uh, before we submit our budget locally, um, which, which is good news for us because we know we're going to see some increased state revenue and it may help to offset, offset some of the reductions that the mayor's office um, has directed us to make. But Dan and M Dan Kaplan and Emily uh, um, will, Girth will walk through these uh, in our proposed budget um, that, that you'll hear a little later in the agenda. Um, so let me just turn to one piece of legislation. You know, the, the, so the Capitol is closed ostensibly, um, but legislation is still moving forward. And there's one bill in particular that I want to talk about because we've seen the increased, increased hunger and increased need for food under COVID is sort of one of the largest needs we've seen and had to respond to. Um, and it's Assembly Bill 2413 by Assemblyman Ting. Co-sponsor is uh, Senator Weiner. So obviously our local delegation. It's called the More CalFresh Less Hunger Act, and um, uh, it's moving through the legislature now. It makes changes to the state CalFresh policies and business practices really to increase participation in the CalFresh program, um, streamlining reporting requirements, reducing paperwork burdens, uh, leveraging Cal, uh, Medi-Cal applications to help increase individuals and families who are applying for CalFresh. So we think this is a bill that's sponsored by CWDA and some other advocates and, and getting this passed would certainly help us locally in terms of getting more households to take advantage of CalFresh. Um, which sort of, uh, that's the only state bill I'm going to talk about. There's a, a several more, but that's the most significant one. And, and given the I want to focus in other areas. Um, and that is really locally. Uh, and I want to talk about the agency's COVID response, and I also want to talk about how the agency's programs and services have been impacted by the COVID pandemic. Um, so firstly, in terms of uh, our local response for COVID, as you know, the Human Services Agency is the lead uh, for the city in its disaster response to provide care and shelter for whoever may need it, given the nature of the emergency. Uh, most typically, this would be for an earthquake and people who lost their homes in an earthquake. Of course, it's different under COVID, and the response really is about providing hotel rooms um, for several reasons. One, uh, and firstly, was hotel rooms to allow people to exit from the hospital to help this, the city and the healthcare system manage the medical surge. This is ostensibly um, individuals who couldn't quarantine at home, people who are either homeless or an SRO or living in, in environments in their housing that don't allow them to quarantine. But also, the, and the bigger activation is really to provide housing support for vulnerable populations who are on the street and in our shelter system through hotel rooms. <clears throat> so to this end, providing both quarantine rooms as well as rooms for homeless to shelter in place um, the uh, Human Services Agency, along with our partners at Public Health and the, and the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, have brought up uh, well over 2,500 hotel rooms um, for these populations. Um, uh, it's, re it's required a huge activation by HSA, you know, hundreds of employees um, who are serving as disaster service workers. Of course, a tremendous amount of resources. Um, it's a system that we propped up that's uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of costs. 75% um, of those costs in some situations are reimbursed by the federal government, which is important to note since so the county, the city and county is not bearing the entire cost of this activation. Um, but it is obviously uh, huge and we've housed at this point well over 1,300 homeless individuals in our SIP room hotels and have quarantined several hundred as well in our other uh, hotel sites. Um, the, the, the plan moving forward for this system of um, hotel rooms and congregate shelter and supports for our homeless and others is set to the transition um, over to the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing under what's called Unified Command out of the Emergency Operations Center, which really means that rather than departments having individual operation centers, um, 
all of the work of the emergency operations for the city goes under a single command. Uh, so the, for, for the housing and hotel program, it means it's really going to be overseen by the Department of Homeless Assistance and Supportive Housing, and HSA leadership will continue to support, but will no longer play the leadership role, the management role that it's played um, since the activation in March. Um, we'll be really in a supportive role with staff rather than uh, overseeing it, which means that the, the two um, directors of our activation, Dan Kaplan and Noel Simmons, will return to their roles on July 6th, leading their respective divisions. Um, and uh, the system that we built up, which really looks like simply an expansion of the uh, homeless response system under the Department of Homeless Assistance and Supportive Housing, it's really just a very large expansion to that. Not to minimize the work uh, at all, but it but it really fits, I think, nicely under what they do as a department, um, and it will be run by nonprofits under oversight by um, the Department of Homeless Assistance and Supportive Housing. The big piece moving forward is to continue to think about what size of the system will look like, and then of course how the system winds down and what that looks like once it transitions out of being an emergency activation for COVID and into a system of response for homeless individuals generally in the city. And um, that'll be, uh, that is being thought through now and will be thought through over the next number of months as we get more clarity on what COVID looks like moving forward. Our other big response uh, as an agency has been around food. Um, uh, the in the trigger for, for for the increased need for food, of course, is the fact that hundreds of thousands of people, well, over 100,000 people lost their jobs under this response. Um, as of May, the number of unemployment insurance claims in the city was over uh, 126,000, which is far more than double the numbers that was at the peak of the Great Recession in 2008, 2009 of 44,000 unemployment claims. The um, unemployment rate is estimated right now to be 15. 15 to 20 percent in the city, um, which means people are out of work, obviously, and that they don't have income. And, and um, unemployment has helped some, but the the um, need for food, the rent, the eviction moratoriums um, that's been in place. You know, clearly there's economic despair as a result of the slowdown of the economy and the significant job loss. Um, this is reflected in a lot of our benefit programs, and, you, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, but let me just walk through some of the emergency feeding efforts that we have been a part of as an agency. The San Francisco Marine Food Bank is reaching now 48,000 San Francisco households a week through their pop-up food pantries where it distributes bags of groceries, food boxes, and pantry at home distribution of home delivered groceries to older adults and people with disabilities. And I should say, Another piece of our response, of course, is to provide food support for individuals who are in the vulnerable category and must shelter in place at home. Um, and so that, that's a big part of our, our activation is our home delivered meals. The school district has also been providing free meals to all children and youth in response to school closures, um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, uh, primarily through school-based distribution sites and through partnerships with CBOs. The Give to SF program, which is over 26, oh, close to $27 million in donations through private philanthropy. Um, a lot of that, uh, 9.8 million of that money has been distributed for priority needs around food and access to housing, and then also security for workers and small businesses. Um, a lot of that money, uh, over $2 million is going to support the existing food network, the food bank, Meals on Wheels, et cetera. Um, we've uh, provided over 8,000 gift cards, uh, uh, Safeway gift cards and others for populations to meet their emergency food needs, um, undocumented households, families with young children, transitional age youth who are on benefits. Um, and of course, the emergency food needs of households in isolation quarantine um, due to the confirmed or suspected infection of COVID and that's until regular food support could be obtained. Um, so, again, just a, just a massive um, undertaking by the Human Services Agency in response to this, and the food will also be put under, the feeding unit will be put under uh, the unified command structure 
uh, and HSA will still have a large role in terms of home delivered meals and other uh, uh, and other food support as well. Um, before I go into um, our, our programs in particular, I want to talk about communications a little bit because um, clearly people sheltering in place at home, not having interactions with our agency face-to-face, -face, um, a lot of programmatic changes coming forward from the state uh, and locally. And so keeping clients, staff, and the general public informed um, about emergency housing, about food, about our programs has been a significant undertaking. Um, uh, we need to promote the ex expanded benefits that come out, the changes in the benefit programs um, as they become available to San Francisco residents. And so I just want to walk through a little bit what our communications staff has done since the COVID response began in March. In our, in our early response, our service centers um, didn't close entirely, but we moved a lot of our operations to online and to phone. Um, we acted quickly to ensure that the public knew that they could, we could still meet their essential service needs by phone and online and email and snail mail, um, creating signage in our building entrances and flyers alerting people of the closures and providing them a whole list of contact info for our programs, updating our website regularly. We have a page that's dedicated specifically to COVID-19 information and updates. Um, text messages being sent out to all of our clients for whom we have mobile numbers in all of our threshold languages. And then ongoing response, you know, as, as updates uh, come from the state and as updates come out locally, letters sent to all clients, about 126,000 of them detailing updates to program reporting and renewal require and, and benefit renewal requirements. Um, Again, text messaging and web updates, uh, our own content that we're pushing out on social media. Partner communications is critical, so sending email communications to our nonprofit community partners and all the information that I talked about, the flyers and such, also always go through our community partners as well. Um, we use them to help spread the word about new programs like the pandemic ABT program, which provides uh, CalFresh support for uh, uh, school-aged children, the Great Plates program, and other supports that we have. Internally, communications has been a challenge as well, of course. Uh, we have over 80% of our staff working through telecommuting and remotely, so keeping them informed through all staff emails, intranet updates. We've had two all staff telephone town halls, uh, which were attended by over 1,000 employees. Um, We've been, we survey them after the calls to, to uh, try to assess whether or not we're meeting their needs in terms of communication. And of course, working with HR and IT as new information becomes available to push that out via email largely to staff. Um, so I think, you know, given our relatively small communication staff of three people, but due to the support from our IT division and HR and our digital services group, we've been able to, to keep, I think, our clients and staff uh, informed um, to the best extent that, that we can. Um, so let me move now into the divisions and just give you a sense of what we're seeing in terms of demand for our programs and our services. Um, we're tracking the data, uh, you know, uh, well, daily really, but I get weekly reports and we put together sort of a summary that gives a picture a little bit of what, what it looked like before COVID and then what it looked like eight weeks since. Um, and let me just walk through a few takeaways with you. I mean, CalFresh saw the largest increase in applications uh, and its caseload. Applications increased by 118%, so more than doubled in the eight weeks after the shelter in place um, was ordered. And that 118% that is compared to a, a, the number of eight, eight weeks of, of applications prior to the shelter in place. The applications seem to have peaked in mid-April and been on a moderate decline since then, but still higher than they were um, sort of when you compare either six, eight weeks prior to SIP to shelter in place, or at least in, in year to year as well. The overall caseload increase between February and May is about 21% in CalFresh. And I would imagine we'll see that increase even more as uh, uh, folks unemployment runs out and um, uh, and we get, I think, even better at doing doing the work that we're doing remotely. 
we saw CalWORKs, CalWORKs applications increase by 35% in the eight weeks uh, since the shelter in place. Um, the caseload overall has only increased by about 4%, again, largely due, I think, to the uh, individuals who lost their jobs and aren't yet eligible due, because of their unemployment insurance income. In terms of CAP, we're seeing a, a fairly significant caseload increase. Um, a lot of that is due to the, the ongoing recertification requirements and homeless verification requirements. Um, individuals are staying on aid, continuing to receive the support rather than dropping off. Um, we've seen the caseload increase by about 15, almost close to 20% since uh, the numbers in, in January. And in Medi-Cal, we only saw the applications increase by about 3%. Um, we did not see a surge similar to CalFresh. Um, uh, not really clear why, I mean, possibly because job losses may not cause the, immediately lost, the immediate loss of health insurance. Uh, and then take a break for Medi-Cal through the Affordable Care Act was already very, already very high. Um, and so we, we, uh, we've already, already penetrated a lot of populations that, that were eligible and that eligibility may not yet. Um, so we'll continue to track these, of course. It's important uh, because of the workload as we move now into June um, and July, we're gonna have to start catching up on a lot of the benefit recertification work that was paused by the state um, as we uh, sort of have to catch up to re recertifying individuals' benefits. There's gonna be a pretty big workload that's gonna hit us in June and July, coupled with an increase in, uh, in applications and all of this while working uh, remotely presents challenges, of course, for us. Um, I'll shift gears a little bit to our Workforce Development Division, which of course has a, a critical role given the extensive job losses we've seen. Um, we're partnering uh, a lot with the, uh, the, the city's um, Department of Off the Office of Economic and Workforce Development um, in, a, in a few areas. One is the Pandemic Paid Sick Leave, which is a locally funded um, initiative which offers five additional days of paid sick leave to support San Francisco businesses and their employees, uh, working collaboratively, collaboratively, as I said, with OEWD. There's $10 million in funds available. Um, over 800, let's see, 836 applications have been submitted, of which 743 are small businesses employing between one and 49 staff, and over 20,000 employees have benefited from this extended um, paid sick leave. Um, uh, we've also joined our, WD, our Workforce Development Division has joined with OEWD to establish and operate the Job Seeker Employer Hotline, which is a 24-7 hotline available to job seekers and employers staffed by HSA and OEWD, questions about unemployment insurance, requests for jobs now and other services. We've received over 2,500 calls to date. And our Workforce Development staff is working remotely to provide over the phone and web services, so direct referrals to employers that are currently hiring for part-time and full-time employment, trying to do vocational assessments um, online, as well as, as um, our typical support, helping with resumes, job applications, interviewing skills, and holding daily webinar sessions on a variety of topics. Um, so the, you know, again, sort of the ability for our programs and staff to adapt to working in the re remote environment um, and seem to have gone fairly well in terms of our continuity of operations. We also have partnered with Goodwill uh, in Jobs Now to provide support to hire disaster service worker or, or, or basically hotel monitor roles that have been filled by disaster ser service worker city employees as we begin to move city employees off of the hotel sites and providing employment opportunities to individuals who had lost their jobs uh, with Goodwill being the employer of record, employer of record but our staff helping with outreach and support and screening a lot of those applications. <clears throat> In our family and children's services world, you know, we're, we're slowly trying to return to more face-to-face -face work when we can. Um, you know, when we shifted gears in March to not no face-to-face, -face, of course, you know, um, the ability for parents to do their monthly visits with their children who, may not be, who aren't in their care, as well as us to do our monthly home visits of, of kids in care you know, were challenging. Um, 
but in terms of ER, now I'll talk how we've accomplished a lot of that in a, in, a, in a moment, but in terms of our emergency response, we really never missed a beat. We um, have equipped our staff with appropriate uh, personal protective equipment, meeting families in their homes. We are up to um, speed on all of our, our timeliness for uh, emergency response investigations. And in fact, our ER emergency response protocol was used to model the state's response for ER. So kudos to um, Joan Miller and her team for, for doing great work at the front end and ensuring kids continue to be safe um, under this pandemic. We started our virtual adoptions. We completed three last week. So doing this rather than um, uh, in person in the court, doing, um, doing it virtually. And then virtual parent-child visits, securing technology for children and parents um, so they can participate in virtual visits with one another, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet. We're slowly phasing back in monthly in-person face-to-face visits with families and, and visitation, and of course, doing all the, the guidance, the public health guidance around distancing and, and masking and the like. And then you may have seen in the examiner at the end of April, April 30th, there was a joint op-ed that Joan uh, Miller did with Katie Albright, who runs, um, used to be the Child Abuse Prevention Center, and now it's called Safe and Sound really about our concerns around child abuse during the pandemic and really that COVID-19 leaves a lot of children at risk. They don't, they're not in their regular touch points and seen by schools or by child care providers or by after school programs or others, coaches. Um, and the, the volume of calls on our hotline dropped you know, considerably. So the op-ed really reminded the public how they can help if they suspect a the child is being abused or neglected contacting, of course, our 24-7 hotline um, uh, or the talk line at 441-KIDS, um, which is the Safe and Sound talk line, and really trying to get the word out that, that kids um, um, kids during this pandemic, pandemic who are at risk are, are, I think, put it more at risk because, again, they're not, they're not seen uh, in their regular sort of environments in schools. And, um, and then I'll just finish with ILSP, who uh, Independent Living uh, Skills Program has done a really good job at meeting the needs of our foster youth in response to the pandemic, creating drop-in hours um, in our ILS in our Independent Living Skills Center, um, uh, doing uh, um, a virtual graduation actually that's going to occur on June 9th to celebrate the academic achievements of our youth and really trying to keep our foster youth um, connected um, uh, as we go through this. You know, again, um, you know, challenging uh, to do this, all this work remotely um, and providing uh, our youth with uh, electronic resources when we can as well. Um, so I know that was a lengthy report. Um, I had a lot to cover. Um, and of course, the big item on the agenda today is the, the, the budget and how we're going to approach um, the revenue loss in the city and the budget targets from the mayor, as well as uh, reconciling what we might see from the state budget as well. So um, I'll pause there. Um, and I don't know if uh, Elizabeth, how you wanna handle questions if everyone's muted. Um, I don't know if we want to try unmuting everyone or, or how, how we want to go ahead and do that. I'm, uh, do, do any of the members of the commission have any questions of Trent Rohr? We want to try to do this in a, uh, a way that can, we can expedite it without a lot of interruptions. So possibly if, if anyone has a question, just say I do and then we'll go to that. Absolutely. Press star six if you're having trouble speaking, Commissioner. Anybody have any questions of Mr. Rohr? Uh, seeing that there are no questions, uh, I'm gonna move on to item five, our employee of the month. And I think that Carmen Campos is on the line. Uh, are you on the line, Carmen? 
Carmen, if you're on mute, can you press star six or unmute yourself on the laptop? Maybe Carmen's not on the line. <laughs> she said she would be. So. Hi. Oh, yeah, you are on the line. Good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, here we go. I'm going to uh, read this now. The commission is pleased to announce that Carmen Campos, CalWorks reception clerk, is the June employee of the month and the commission's first virtual winner. Due to the COVID-19 shelter-in-place order for the city and county of San Francisco, Carmen's award was postponed. She was originally suggested to be the March Employee of the Month. Carmen patiently waited. Two commission meetings were canceled due to COVID-19. The Human Service Agency Commission finally received the green light from the mayor's office to convene remotely. For this June special meeting, we are honored that Carmen is able to join us on this call. Carmen works as a reception clerk in the fast-paced and often hectic CalWORKs service center lobby at 170 Otis. The CalWORKs service lobby is often a place where families in crisis come to receive real-time assistance and referrals for other necessary city services. Despite the pace and sometimes overwhelming environment, Carmen keeps a positive and professional attitude and demeanor. Day, each day, Carmen makes sure that no client is left behind. Carmen ex exemplifies the growing vision of the CalWORKs 2.0 movement by, asking, by making sure that clients are served in a timely manner once they enter our lobby. To ensure this, she often observes and monitors the lobby scene to minimize client wait times when possible. She closely monitors the flow of lobby traffic, catching and correcting client routing errors. Carmen's knowledge of the lobby management system and service center operations helps our program prevent longer than necessary wait times and promotes better overall customer service. Another way Carmen goes above and beyond is to frequently is by frequently insisting her fellow colleagues from volunteer to assist and train new, accept, new reception clerks or helping out a supervisor or a lead worker to providing translation services for our lobby greeters or our distribution staff even when, she's, even when she is not the day's Spanish translator. Carmen is extremely knowledgeable about CalWORKs, operations and resources and uses her knowledge to assist clients as well as her peers and colleagues. Even with her level of knowledge, Carmen continues to seek further information and resources to assist clients when they need additional support. Carmen is a true leader, quick to rise to the occasion, and needing little support or direction when her supervisor is out or away. Carmen provides a tremendous amount of support not only to clients, but to the overall CalWORKs program. We would like to honor Carmen for her true dedication to assisting colleagues and peers and for serving the citizens of San Francisco with the June 2020 Employee of the Month. Congratulations, Carmen. And Mr. Rohr. Hello. Thank you. We're doing our, Elizabeth and I are clapping Yay. here. I'm clapping too. Hey, hey. Here, 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 here. Shout, shout, shout. <laughs> I just I just want to say real quick, Carmen, um um that that the often the um interaction someone has, you know, at the agency or anywhere really, can set the tone for for services and, and um and and whether someone's coming in in you know, crisis or or uh Whole whole host of, of issues they may have, you know, having a a, a, a welcoming and professional and, and helpful first interaction with the agency goes a long way towards them, um, you know, feeling valued and um, feeling that that you know the customer is at, at the front of of what we're trying to do. And so, thank you for being that front face for us in CalWorks and and um, it's. 
vitally important, and I'm glad we could recognize you today. Uh, sorry we couldn't do it in person in March, but um, thanks for being on, and congratulations. It's, uh, of course, very, very well deserved. Um, thank you for just everyone for having me here today. Um, I'm kind of nervous, but you know, <laughs> um, we're not in the uh, main center, but I just want to give a little thank you. Um, I can express myself grateful on uh, um, just being nominated for the month of the poem and the month for this month. Uh, I take great, great pride in my job and giving above and beyond for the clients. Um, I'm always empathy, compassion, resource, uh, resourceful um, for our clients and be as helpful as possible, especially um, Um, sorry. Um, and especially being in the front line of the contact. Um, and I understand how difficult it could be as, um, to ask for assistance. I always, um, always want to make sure um, to express the experience as a positive as I can and do it with a great energy and a smile. So I just want to thank everybody. Thank you, Carmen. And I'm going to make it a point. Well, thank you, Carmen. Very well deserved. And thank you, Carmen. Uh, this is uh, Scott Kahn. I'm going to look for you in the lobby when this all goes away and when you're back there with your <laughs> smile greeting people. And I'll go, I'm going to go out of my way to find you and, and see you personally, and thank you. Okay, thank you. Your clock is on its way, Carmen. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, Yay! Moving I, uh, on to item six is our consent calendar. Um, do any of my fellow commissioners want to remove an item for individual discussion? If there are no one speaking up, then I just need to ask for a vote to approve the consent calendar. All in favor? Or may, let's get a motion first. Yeah. I so move adoption. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Hey, Scott, uh, President Collin? Yes? Um, this is Trent. Uh, Elizabeth or, or Scott, Commissioner Collin, is there a way to unmute Commissioner Semmel? Uh, I know that she had some questions, I think probably about my report um, or in general, and, and I, don't, I don't think she was able to, to do that. Commissioner Stemmel, are you on? Or, or is you, are you on mute still? I can put people in uh, broadcast mode and see what happens. One moment, please. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. We are now in talk mode, it said. Ms. Labar, does that help? 
Yeah, we're in talk mode. That means everyone can speak. I, I'm trying to get that Commissioner Stemmel. I know that she had some questions. Yes, yes. Okay. I had I had some questions earlier on on your report, Mr. Roar, and I will send you an email. I won't I won't hold up the meeting. Uh, Elizabeth, I think we need to put everyone else on mute again. It's too much bad noise. All participants are now in listen-only mode. Do you want to move forward with the meeting? Yeah, we're going to move forward to, uh, did anybody make a motion to accept the um, I think we're on. consent calendar? And it, did we pass that or did Rita had some questions? That was just related to? Uh, McRae um, right. first and then Yamasaki second. Okay, the all, all uh, members of the commission um, we're voting on the consent calendar. It's, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Sorry. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. Aye. 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 <laughs> All participants are now in listen-only mode. You're going to have to switch star six commissioners again. I apologize so you can speak. So we can move on to the next one because they all said aye. Well, now we're, we're moving on to... Um, commission business and... Uh, item 7A is a presentation and possible action of the department's proposed budget. Um, and I'm calling on Dan Kaplan. Okay, sorry folks, bear with me here. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. All participants are now in listen-only mode. Scott? Yes? Uh, could we go back and, and get Rita's questions before we... Uh, Rita, Rita uh, suggested, I guess you didn't hear it, uh, uh, Commissioner Yamasaki is that she was going to send the questions via email to Trent. It was easier um, to do it that way. Thank you. And thank you, George. Um, okay, now uh, commission uh, business action items. A is presentation of possible action on department's proposed budget. Uh, Dan Kaplan, are you on the line and Emily? I am. Okay, uh, go right ahead. I'll pull it okay. up. Okay. You're going to put up the presentation? Thanks, Liz. Yep. Uh, bear with me a second, sorry. Great, thank you. Why don't we go to the second slide? Thanks a lot. So, commissioners, um, obviously we presented a budget to you in February and uh, submitted it. And then, as you all know, we um, started to move into the world of COVID-19 and it became 
obvious fairly quickly that the financial situation of the city was going to change and deteriorate fairly rapidly. So back in December, um, when um, the, the uh, city controller and mayor's office and the budget and legislative advocates office get, got together, analyst office, excuse me, got together um, to make a prediction uh, of the amount of um, money that would need it to be balanced around for the next biennium. Uh, they came up with a, uh, a shortfall of $420 million for the biennium, um, which in the scheme of things is a pretty manageable amount. Uh, in March, um, with the initial information about the way COVID-19 would hit the city's economy, uh, they changed their projection to uh, a range of $1.1 to $1.7 billion. And they uh, subsequently settled on $1.7 billion as, um, as the, uh, the size of the, can we go back one slide? The size of the, uh, the deficit that we'd have to balance around. Um, they made some decisions around, um, or some assumptions around uh, the delay of wage increases consistent with the labor agreements that are in place at the present time, which uh, call on wage increases to be put off by six months uh, in the event of a shortfall of over a certain size, nowhere near as big as, as $1.7 billion. Um, and they assumed um, that uh, that federal and state revenue would stay, would stay fairly consistent. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, there we go. So if you break this out over three years, they uh, have recalculated a shortfall against uh, the current year's budget of a quarter of a billion dollars and then uh, essentially three quarters of a billion dollars in each of the uh, next two years. And, you know, the largest part of that is around um, loss in, in revenue relative to where we were um, and expenditures increasing. Can we move to the next slide? So, um, one of the things that I should say about this um, forecast is it really doesn't take into account the costs of the response. Earlier um, today, Trent mentioned that um, HSA is heavily involved in um, the setting up of housing, primarily for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, and feeding programs, and the costs of those programs are not worked into um, this budget, but uh, as he also said, uh, the costs are hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Uh, there is some significant federal reimbursement for, uh, for those costs because it is part of a emergency and uh, FEMA money is available and other um, Especially legislated uh, dollars are available, but still, um, there were there will be many tens of millions and probably hundred millions of uh, costs that uh, that the city is facing associated with this response. Um, so obviously, we don't know. Um, how long this event will go on, we are led to believe that um, our shelter-in-place uh, regime will be in effect in one form or another for the better part of the next fiscal year, uh, although, of course, we will be opening the economy very gradually um, and every step of the way testing those that opening against a number of key health indicators. Uh, still, you know, even as the economy opens, uh, the shock to the local economy has been very great, and, uh, and we are assuming that we will be uh, 
at least a couple of years coming through the, uh, the local recession. Um, so here we are, we're, we're facing um, losses in city revenues, we're facing more demand for city services, and when the state uh, issued its May revise, uh, it indicated that it was going to have a budget shortfall, an anticipated budget shortfall of $54 billion, um, which is, of course, huge. So we went from a, uh, a healthy surplus to a big deficit. Um, and, and that, of course, uh, calls for recalculation up and down uh, the city system. Can we go to the next slide? Thanks. So um, the, the mayor's office um, issued new balancing instructions um, a few weeks ago, and uh, and we have all been involved in a very rapid process of uh, figuring out how we would balance against new reduction targets. But the reduction targets are really not all we're dealing with here. Um, so on this slide, you can see three sets of numbers. I think that the easiest set to look at are the ones that are bolded in the, uh, at the top of the lower half of the slide. And this really represents the additional reductions um, that HSA needs to propose uh, in the first and second years of the upcoming biennium. So four million in the first year, five million in the year after, um, and there's also a contingent uh, uh, cut that we'll have to address for um, the first year of the biennium. Uh, so these, these are essentially 15% general fund reductions. And as, as I've said, I think many times in these presentations, um, the, uh, the reduction targets are calculated against our discretionary general fund. So um, it doesn't include local monies that are involved in special funds like the Dignity Fund and DAS or the, um, uh, the Educational Enrichment Fund in, um, in OECE. And it doesn't include general fund costs that are associated with the aid budget. Um, but it does include the, the what we call the discretionary general funds that we can move around the administration budget. Um, the mayor's office also uh, directed that we put in place a hiring freeze, um, that we pause our uh, non-essential capital projects, um, that we don't issue RFPs for new services, and that we don't uh, start new programming. Let's move to the next slide. So, um, in the budget, in the state budget, um, we face two other very substantial problems and um, several smaller problems. Um, the very substantial problems are around 1991 and 2011 realignment. And as I'm sure you remember, uh, 1991 and 2011 realignment um, represent uh, two very similar uh, streams of um, relatively flexible funding for social services programs. Uh, the reason they're called 1991 and 2011 realignment is those are the years in which uh, the legislature transferred responsibility for funding large portions of the social services programs uh, from the state to local government and then provided an additional revenue source to do that. Um, both 1991 and 2011 realignment revenue um, represent a portion of the state sales and use tax and a portion a vehicle licensing fee. Uh, the mixes are a little different, um, but, but those are the two sources of funding for both 91 and 2011 realignment. And 
obviously in the face of a recession, um, we would expect drops in uh, receipts for both sales and use tax and vehicle licensing fee. Um, and when the, when the governor's office uh, made its projections for the May revise, there were very substantial um, drops. The way the city of San Francisco handles um, budgeting for 1991 realignment is it, it actually treats it almost as if it were general funds. And so um, in good years, the, the human services programs haven't benefited from increases and in bad years, haven't really suffered from declines. And, um, and that's, we believe, how this will be handled again uh, in the current situation. 2011 realignment is newer and um, we don't have as much um, history around this one, um, but, um, but we are, you know, looking at it as a, uh, as a, big, um, as a big gap that we um, uh, have broken into two pieces. One is around the growth that we anticipated in 2011 realignment for the budget year. And we, we had assumed growth of a little over $4 million. Um, and that was money that goes largely into our family and children's services programs. Um, and then the other piece of it is the base. And, uh, and that in the base, we are looking at a drop of about uh, a little over $8 million. So if you put them together, they come to roughly $13 million that we had counted on um, in our February submission that we now think will not be there. Um, and we have certainly been talking uh, with the mayor's office about, um, about uh, a citywide approach to filling uh, the base uh, loss um, and that we would, uh, we would be working on uh, filling the uh, the growth loss uh, in our budget. So if you think of it um, in those terms, that adds another $4 million and change to our uh, problem. Um, we have some other areas um, where uh, our situation under the, uh, the governor's may revise is a little worse um, than, uh, than it was anticipated in the IHSS program and in the Medi-Cal program, the governor has proposed uh, stopping inflationary growth. Um, that to some extent may be uh, reversed uh, by the legislature when the legislature passes its budget. Um, the governor did put in relatively significant increases um, in the CalFresh and CalWorks budgets. And it's, of course, hard for us to say exactly how much at this point because it's subject to allocation. It's also the case that uh, across those two programs, the legislature and the governor are, are not exactly in the same place. But we anticipate growth in both programs. As Trent mentioned, uh, we are already seeing growth in our CalFresh tape caseload and certainly growth um, in the number of applications for uh, CalFresh. CalWorks uh, will lag behind uh, to some extent uh, because uh, folks who lose jobs will, uh, for the most part, need to um, use up unemployment insurance before uh, hitting CalWorks eligibility levels, but that will start over the next several months. Um, and of course, CalWorks has both a, um, a cash benefit to it and it has uh, a substantial, what we call administrative budget, uh, supporting employment services. And that's where the real growth comes in as well as in childcare. Uh, and, and of course it comes in in those two areas because the anticipated um, a, a very substantial increase in need in both those areas. Um, so as the note at the bottom of this slide shows, the legislature um, has been reacting to the governor's uh, proposals and backfills uh, some of the 1991 realignment loss. Um, 
and uh, and reverses uh, cuts in child care rates and puts a number of uh, senior services programs uh, back into uh, into funding uh, that the governor had removed. So, um, so we have some losses and very flexible uh, pots of money like realignment. We um, may see a little less inflationary growth in a few programs, and we have what really amounts to some pretty significant caseload-driven growth, uh, especially in CalFresh and CalWorks. May we go to the next slide? So um, we are, as we always do in situation, trying to assess the, uh, the puts and takes in, uh, in state revenue. Um, there is probably some room to offset some of the loss in some of the administration program budgets with some of the gains in others. Um, we have uh, removed all substitutions from our uh, budget proposal that, that aren't already acted on. And um, as, as I'm sure you, you know, during the course of a fiscal year, we often propose changes in various classifications, um, typically when positions become vacant uh, to make better use of the positions we have in our budget. So a number of those have, have actually been approved uh, by the um, Department of Human uh, Resources and by the mayor's office, um, and we will leave in uh, substitutions in the budget for those because that's a matter of getting our funding to match what we're actually spending. But we've eliminated the uh, the new uh, position substitutions or reclassification requests in our budget. Um, we have uh, proposed to um, step away from three leases that um, will be expiring this fiscal year. Uh, one is the lease. Um, for um, our investigations group. Uh, one is the lease for a space we have at 1360 Mission, and one is a space that our records management group occupies. Um, and all three of those groups, uh, plus the uh, first uh, five office, um, uh, will be moving to a uh, space that is newly available to us at 1650 Mission. This is the space that the planning department used to occupy, well, still occupies as of today, but uh, by the early autumn we'll have uh, left. Uh, the planning department is going to the, uh, the new building at 1500 Mission, and we are taking over their space at 1650 Mission. Um, and then we are also proposing to spend down um, a number of balances in uh, in program in project budgets that that run from year to year, uh, where we have uh, built up uh, small balances. So we will use those to offset general fund need. May we go to the next slide? So when we break this down at the divisional level, um, we have growth um, in, uh, in a number of caseload costs. Um, CalWorks uh, certainly will grow in, in line with the projections of, uh, of the state and certainly our own projections. The CalWorks aid budget is at 97% federal and state money. So our general fund impact from the growth of the CalWorks caseload is small, even though the total fund dollars will be quite big. Um, the CAP caseload, on the other hand, is, um, is general funded. Uh, and so as uh, people who have been in the workforce uh, lose jobs uh, and, and if they are um, adults without children who qualify for CAP, they can come on to the CAP caseload, and, uh, and that will be a significant increase in cost. Um, 
another thing that's happening that's driving the cap case load to some extent is that as shelter becomes less available in the city, we will have more unsheltered individuals. That's bad in its own right, of course. Um, it also has a financial impact in our budget because um, we, uh, we pay a higher grant to folks who aren't in the shelter system. Uh, so, so there's going to be a significant growth there. Um, we are estimating that we will receive about $2.2 million more a year in the CalFresh allocation uh, of, of state money. Um, and that's money that we will need to spend on an increased overtime uh, budget in our SF benefits net area. Um, over the last several months, uh, requirements for redetermination of the program at CalFresh um, have been suspended. But um, in the next few months when uh, we have to start doing those, Redeterminations again, we will have, in essence, double the workload for a while. So we're anticipating the need for substantial overtime during that period. Um, within the Cal Works program, we are going to propose um, to add about five million in funding uh, and then the sort of the repurposing of a certain amount of existing jobs now money. Um, to really enhance our private sector wage subsidy programs. Um, the goal at this point uh, really will be to work with um, a population that has been, um, has been working and, uh, and is job ready and, and doesn't face uh, very substantial uh, barriers to employment except for the fact that jobs have been. Um, and so the goal here is to uh, craft a subsidized wage program that will allow us to get many hundreds or thousands of folks back into the workforce uh, more quickly uh, than, than they would have come in otherwise. Um, so that, those are the major areas in ESSS. In FCS, um, where, as you recall, uh, we are dealing with the financial impacts of the end of the 4E waiver, this situation um, exacerbates our problem by the loss of the uh, 2011 realignment revenue. And we are looking to make additional targeted cuts um, in a number of contracts um, to help deal with that. I, I think the advantage of the moment we're at is our caseloads uh, have been going down for a while and, and, um, and up to this incident have continued to go down. So there is actually some room in a number of our contracts to, uh, to reduce dollars and to reduce units of service purchased without um, making essential services not available uh, to clients who have been getting them. Um, within the administration area, a lot of our focus has been around um, how do we recast the budget so that uh, we can do a good job supporting telecommuting and our increased needs for uh, personal protective equipment um, and 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 so we're shifting money uh, essentially to do that. Um, telecommute is um, is something that we moved into very quickly as the shelter in place order came down. Um, we got um, three quarters of our workforce up and running remotely very quickly. Uh, but as we settle into doing uh, telecommuting as our main way of working for uh, the next fiscal year, we have to circle back and we have to really look at ways of, of uh, improving the support that workers get through technology, uh, to some extent through ergonomic equipment for home offices. Um, and, uh, and we need to really move into ways of 
of running this organization in a much more distributed manner, and that will require um, IT and other support. Um, and then uh, the last bullet on here notes that uh, we will uh, take money that has been in what we call our CalWIN project. CalWIN is our uh, current state automated welfare system. And, uh, and spend down our balances as part of our transition to the new CALSA system, which is, uh, well, which was slated for, for early 2023. Um, I am uh, anticipating that uh, the current moment will push it back a little bit, but we haven't had new schedules yet. May we go to the next slide? So uh, just to touch on, on DAS and OEC, uh, even though they're not the focus of the Human Services Commission, they are part of our large budget. Um, the, one of the big costs in uh, DAS is the IHSS um, wage increase. Um, the IHSS workers, and there were about 20,000 IHSS workers in the city. Uh, provide personal assistance services to, uh, to people who qualify for the uh, IHSS program who are people who are Medi-Cal eligible and who have personal assistance needs. And um, a couple of years ago, as part of the minimum compensation ordinance, uh, a schedule of IHSS wage increases uh, were uh, legislated in the city. On July 1st, we were meant to do a dollar per hour increase, uh, which would have increased the city's costs uh, for this program by $4.5 million a year. Um, that has been put on hold, um, and that will reduce the amount of what we call the maintenance of effort payments for the IHSS program. Um, we are still discussing whether uh, and under what terms it makes sense for a partial year increase to go into effect. Um, we, um, under the uh, DOS program, the Dignity Fund grows uh, by its, uh, by its uh, legislation at $3 million a year, except there is a trigger to eliminate growth in years with um, with large deficits, and that trigger has been pulled for this year, so the $3 million additional money uh, will not automatically flow to the Dignity Fund. Um, and then there are a number of uh, funds within uh, DAS that we will be looking at to reduce to support other, uh, other efforts, mainly associated with COVID-19. So as Trent mentioned, the feeding needs uh, for uh, COVID-19 are very large. The amount of one-time money we have sitting in DOS funds is certainly insufficient to meet those, but, um, but it may be a contribution to the effort to, uh, to meet them. Um, and then we will be looking at ways of moving money around the, uh, the DOS budget to, uh, to better serve clients in, uh, under the shelter-in-place orders. In OECE, uh, there is an additional $3.8 million in CalWORK Stage 1, which is, of course, related to the caseload increase and the, uh, and the increased uh, welfare-to-work budget. Um, but there are other things going on in there that are very important to acknowledge. And um, one is that, that under sheltering in place, there are very new rules for um, for uh, child care operations, and um, most child care centers will be able to serve only roughly half of the kids um, that they were uh, before. Um, there's more um, teacher involvement, and there's more spacing, obviously, involved. Um, so costs will either stay more or less the same, uh, or possibly increase in some cases a little bit, uh, revenues from children uh, actually able to be served will go down. And um, the other challenge we have in the OECE program is it's, it's, um, 
it has as a significant funding source um, the TEF, um, the Educational Enrichment Fund uh, money, and we're anticipating about a $7 million drop in that. So we are looking at, um, at shifts in spending within that program. We're also looking at drawing down more in the way of TEF reserves. Um, to be able to uh, continue to serve close to as many clients and keep uh, the uh, the key provider community within the child care system uh, funded uh, during a time when we uh, will have less revenue coming in on a um, on a uh, per child basis. So that will be an area there where we will have some challenges. May we go to the next slide? Okay. So we are um, pulling together our um, our departmental submission, and we are meant to make a submission on uh, the 12th, which is this Friday. Um, in our conversations with the mayor's budget office, we will certainly do that. We anticipate this uh, being more of a discussion process than we've had in uh, previous budget submissions uh, because we are moving very quickly and our situation is very fluid as is that of many other agencies. Um, so what I've described is the broad outlines of the kinds of issues we are uh, looking at. Um, we will submit in middle June. The mayor will submit her budget to the board uh, a month and a half later. And uh, during the month of August, um, the, uh, the board will deliberate and, um, and then will uh, pass a budget and the mayor will sign at the beginning of October. Um, so, uh, you know, typically we have a budget two weeks into the fiscal year. Um, this year we will have a budget uh, three months into the fiscal year. So we are at this point uh, anticipating that we'll be running on an interim budget, uh, which is modeled after the budget for uh, fiscal year 2021 that was approved by uh, the board last July with some very minor changes. Um, and that will be our budget during the first three months of the, uh, the fiscal year. And then we will have our actual, our final budget uh, one quarter into the year. So with that, I'll stop and, uh, and Emily and I uh, will try to answer any questions you have. Um, are, th are there any members of the commission that have any questions? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Yamasaki. Uh, I don't have a specific question because there are so many uh, moving targets, you might say. So uh, what I would like to know is uh, what action is expected of the commission Today. Thanks. I think that's a good a good question, Commissioner. So, typically, what we do is we bring to you a budget proposal um, where uh, we give a, a broad, high-level presentation. We provide you a memo, and then we give you a much more detailed budget book. And we have not done that here. Um, and the reason is because we are moving so fast and because the situation is so fluid. Uh, I think what we would really like at this point is for you to accept this report and to um, accept the fact that we will continue to update you as we move forward through this process. We, we uh, obviously can't ask you for a formal approval in the sense that we uh, we would during a normal budget submission period. So from our standpoint, are we then going to be just asking for a motion to move forward, George? Well, 
uh, at least for the sake of discussion, and uh, I, I welcome any suggestions, including from uh, Mr. Kaplan, uh, I will move that the commission authorize staff to continue its uh, study of the uh, future budget and to engage in uh, discussions with the mayor's office and other appropriate parties. Um, is there a second to George's motion from any members of the commission seconding George's motion? Yeah, I'll second the motion. Um, yeah, it's 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 fine. It's fine. It gives the, the staff a ability to go forward. Yes. And this is Reverend McRae. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, so it's a moved and seconded that we authorize Dan Kaplan to move forward and um, bring this to us again in the future. Is that correct, Dan? Yes, we will continue to update you. This is obviously uh, the first time in my experience of uh, of building a budget under an emergency declaration, and I'm sure that's true for most people. But, uh, but yes, we will continue to work with the mayor's office, and we will keep you up to date on our progress as we move forward. Okay. Uh, yeah. that I, I just had a question, Mr. Kaplan. Did you indicate what what the percentage of the existing budget and interim budget might might hold? What percentage of it? Would it be 75% of it? What? what? What will our total budget be relative? No, I mean, just the than... interim. Will, will, the, will the department be working at 75% capacity, 60% monetary capacity? What do you think that will be? Yeah, I, it'll be much higher than that. Emily, do you have a, a rough and ready number? I, we, are, we are going to be running as a full service agency. Um, okay. going through the first quarter of the fiscal year. All our programs will be operational in one sense. Working in a, in a remote environment is certainly different, um, but we are not shutting down any of our uh, benefits programs. We are continuing to move forward on our child welfare programs. We are continuing in, in both GOSS and OECE uh, to provide the same range of services to clients um, as we have been. Um, you know, the shelter in place order does affect the way we work um, and in some cases affects the availability of, of some programs that require clients to come together. But, but for the most part, our programs will be functioning um, with the uh, same benefit structures they have been, and, uh, and we will be continuing to work with clients as we have been. Okay, well, I, I just latched on to your word, same range, and, and I'm just supposing, I'm asking about what do you think that range is going to look like in, in, in the interim, just in the interim, because I see the interim is transitional to what the new norm is going to look like. Well, actually, uh, and please, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, until the uh, budget is approved, which, as you said, could be several months, uh, we're actually operating, when we go into the new fiscal year, we will be operating without a budget as such. Yes. So it's just uh, a, pr a practical... Uh, expenditures, as Mr. Kaplan has said, that we will be maintaining our levels of service. Is that correct, Dan? Yes. Partially. It's partially correct. So, um, so we will have a budget as we go into the next fiscal year. It will be an interim budget and it will be approved by the board. Um, oh, there will be an interim budget? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll be looking at that. Then I, I, I'm just trying to see what the parachute looks like. <laughs> so we have a we have a motion now, and by George, and then by uh, excuse me, Commissioner Yamasaki, and one by Reverend McRae, a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? So moved. Okay, and so thank you, and we will certainly be keeping you up to date. Okay. When do you think when do you think you'll you'll need us back in session, Mr. Cavillan, to keep the process moving? Uh, I am I am not sure. <laughs> this is we we will be you know continuing our conversations with the mayor's office, and uh, and we will be fleshing out what this looks like. Um, both, uh, both with regard to the agency's traditional budget, and then of course, uh, with regard to uh, the extraordinary work that's being done around the response, and and we will, uh, we will. I, I, I hate to make it sound like we will be in touch, but we will. Um, right, right. We'll be in touch. Certainly, certainly, we will be keeping you up to date as there's more information available. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on to item B, requesting authorization to modify and renew various grant and contra contractual agreements, uh, Johanna Gendelman. Johanna, are you here? Hold on one second. This is Elizabeth Leon. I'm with HSA Contracts. Um, not sure if Johanna is having trouble um, logging in or being able to hear us, but I, I'll just read the. Okay. Uh, we are requesting. Who yes. Who is speaking now? My name is Elizabeth Leon. I'm okay, a senior contract know. manager at in the contracts department. Right. Thank you. I'm sorry. You would cut out for a second. Thank you very much. Okay. So the contracts department is requesting authorization to modify and renew various grants and contractual agreements with multiple providers for the provision of various services for the period of April 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2025 for an additional amount of $47 million Seven hundred seventy-five thousand nine hundred, plus a ten percent contingency for a revised modification amount not to exceed fifty-one million eight hundred and eighty thousand five hundred and fifty dollars. Um, I think Johanna is having problems though with um, with her microphone, so I will try and answer questions as best I can. Any members? I think I might. Go ahead. Who's on the line now? I think Johanna was trying to jump in, but. Um, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you all the people who just texted me saying, star six, star six. Uh, good afternoon, Johanna. Commissioners. Johanna, good afternoon. welcome. Oh, uh, welcome. welcome. I wish I could say it's nice to see your faces, but I look forward to seeing your faces in, per in per person. So okay. here's what Contracts has been doing briefly, is that most of the contract staff has been dispatched to the COVID emergency. So we have very few staff actually present and mostly we're focused on the emergency response doing the things that Dan and Trent talked about. And we have 28 contracts for you before you today to be renewed 
and they cover the length of uh, just uh, one year for one year renewals or things that were interrupted because of the COVID pandemic, like uh, procurements we were in the middle of doing. And then some contracts that we still need to do business on, so they're longer term, like um, I can go through each item individually. I will do my best to answer questions about them, but we divvied them up into areas. So briefly, they're divided up into four, five areas. One's the city span for the carbon database. That's how we pay our vendors. Um, ergonomics is probably going to be desperately needed with everyone working from home. Help a mother out is our diaper bank and the allied universal security. That's one of the COVID related contracts that's coming before you today. That's 9.3 million for security at all of our alternative housing sites. CalFresh, we're extending the 211 San Diego for one year. We had hoped to do a procurement, but all our procurements were suspended after uh, the epidemic. And family and children's services, we have seven different services, uh, one year for a better way for our peer parent services, first place for youth for the ILSP skills, Hamilton for the residential services for Holloway, and then the companion program, homeless prenatal program for bringing families home. This was originally, those two were originally scheduled to go in March. Um, St. Vincent de Paul for domestic violence intervention services for our FCS families, and that's a one year renewal because we were hoping to procure that service and we were not able to complete that. Um, finally, Seneca for three programs. Uh, one is RAP services for foster youth, which actually was the last procurement we were able to complete. So the Seneca is a two year service. Visitation and transportation is what we often call our first stop program. And our East Bay Visitation Center, which is a collaboration with, I think, Contra Costa. Finally, two years of substance abuse testing for our clients. And then for CalWORKs and Welfare to Work, we're doing the Jobs Now launch pad. And I think that's for more than one year. Ariba Juntos for our um, technology supported tax preparation. And we're also giving them additional funds this year because tax season was extended this year because of the epidemic. Also their transitional employment and youth employment. For the LGBT Center, we're, all, we're providing uh, two more years of services along with 75,000 of private funding for their food. Young community developers, transitional employment, Casa de Madres for domestic violence, the San Francisco College for academic services, uh, mission economic development for the same services Arriba Juntos does, but for a different, er different area of the city for the technology supported tax prep. And then finally, Hamilton for the CalWORKs housing support. That was another one we were hoping to be able to complete a procurement on and we were not. Finally, from our Office of Early Childhood and Education, we have a database that we're, they're very excited about, been trying a long time for that one. And the Children's Council for the Family Child Care Quality Network. And if you look at the second page, the spreadsheet that I sent you, you can see um, the actions, the amounts, the timelines, and if it was related to COVID. And now that I've actually learned how to press star six, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Now for sure people should have questions. Um, <laughs> right, that was a lot to say. To members of the commission? You did that very well. Thank you very much. That was clear. You, you got it out there before us. I'm just, I'm just looking at that last column, action due to C. That, that's the COVID? Yeah, that's a that's a cutoff. Yeah, that was a, that was that the procurement was um, interrupted because of COVID, where we decided as a department to do a one year extension of the okay. continuing the current provider. Yeah, I noticed that the diaper program is one of those for for four million. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, thank you. I so move, Mr. Chair. Is there any, a, a second to the motion? Don't we? Uh, is the city attorney on the line? I don't think so. I, I believe that uh, we need to, and I believe there are 29 uh, different items. I believe we have to uh, approve, uh, uh, treat them each separately. So I would suggest numbering them or giving them letters, A, B, C, D, and so forth, and then 
getting down to double A, double B, and double C. And, and I thought, this is Johanna, I thought to get clarification about that, and I was advised that it was one action to approve the whole, uh, I think kit and caboodle is the technical word. <laughs> yeah, uh, or you, shebang, you, the whole shebang. So the city attorney? Exactly, the whole shebang. Who, who gave you uh, that advice? I think David Reese, but but I'm I am not 100% sure. So we could. It's 28 items. Um, we could just say A, B. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, well, all right. Why why don't we just take them? To, I I feel safer taking them individually so that sure we don't we don't have to uh, go back. Okay, to, then let's go. Um, well, we can, can. You know, it isn't that bad. Let's do it by name then. It's not that bad. I got, I got you on this. I can totally take us through this. Okay, okay the so first one is to approve City Span Technologies for Carbon Development for the term seven one twenty to six thirty twenty five, or not to exceed all that. Just give us the name of the uh, uh, agency. Oh, excellent! I like your style. Okay. First agency is to approve city span technologies for the carbon database. I so move. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So move. Our next our next one is CPS HR Consulting for Conflict Resolution, Team Building, and Executive Coaching. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, commissioners. EK Ergonomics for ergonomics for, oh, that's all. I so move. Second. 211 San Diego for CalFresh Telephone Outreach. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. A better way for peer parent program for child welfare. Move. So, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Binti Incorporated for the FCS Resource Family Recruitment Web Portal. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. First place for youth for independent living skills for foster youth. So, so moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hamilton Families for Supportive Housing at 538 Holloway. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Homeless prenatal program for bringing families home. So move. Second. Aye. 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 Homeless prenatal program for substance abuse services for FCS. So move. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mega Lab Services for Substance Abuse Testing. So move. Second. Aye. Seneca Family of Agencies for the East Bay Visitation Center. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Seneca Family of Agencies for the Wraparound Program for Foster Youth. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Seneca Family of Agencies for the First Stop Program. So move. Second. Aye. 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 St. Vincent de Paul Society for Domestic Violence Intervention Services. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Arriba Juntos for Technology Supported Tax Preparation. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Arriba Juntos for Transitional Employment Services. Second. Uh, <laughs> so move. I know, it's hard. It's hard. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Arriba Juntos for Youth Employment Services. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Hamilton Families for CalWORKs Housing Support Services. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Help a mother out for diaper bank services. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. La Casa de las Madres for domestic violence services. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Launchpad Incorporated for Jobs Now Employment Program. So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mission Economic Development Agency for Technology Supported Tax Preparation. So move. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 San Francisco Community College District for Academic Services. So, so moved. Move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. San Francisco LGBT Community Center for Transgender Employment Services and Food Relief. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Four more commissioners, Young Community Developers for Transitional Employment Services. So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Children's Council for the Family Child Care Quality Network. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Allied Security for COVID-19 Alternative Housing Security. So move. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And our last one is West Ed for the COCA database. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well done, commissioners. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay. So, moving on to public comment. Is there any public comment? I see none. So, therefore, our meeting is adjourned. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Wonderful job. Appreciate everybody's patience. Fun.